Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Exploring Faith, Pursuing Grace. My name is Daniel Rogers, and I'm just delighted to be able to host this program for you week by week. I don't know if you picked up on the pattern yet or not, but every other week I'm doing a solo episode answering specific questions about uh, what you might call Church of Christ issues. Now, of course, they're not issues specific to the Church of Christ, but they are things that we have dealt with, and since our primary audience seems to be people who grew up in the Restoration Movement, uh, that's just what we're going to call it, Church of Christ issues. And this is our third episode on worship. If you haven't listened to the first episode on what's called the regulative principle, which is where we get the language for a pattern of worship, it'd probably be good for you to listen to that. Uh, The second episode on instrumental music may also offer some helpful tidbits as well. But for this episode, uh, you should be able to listen to it as a standalone thing. It would just be good for you to have the language that I provide from the first episode on worship before tackling this one. But again, that's not to discourage you from listening to this one if you're just hopping in at this point in the discussion. So I want to start off by saying that my allegiance is first and foremost to God. Uh... It's to God, through Jesus, and through the Spirit. My allegiance is not to any group, label, denomination, way of thinking. If you want to call me a fundamentalist or conservative or liberal or progressive or whatever, egalitarian or complementarian, I'm not really interested in that. One of the reasons is I just find those labels, although they may be helpful for describing someone's position in a particular context, Um, I find them uh, more divisive than helpful most of the time. It's often a way to dismiss someone's position or someone's belief or someone's idea without ever even actually engaging them. And so going, well, that's just Calvinism, or that's just Arminianism, or that's just Pentecostalism, or whatever, just slapping a label on it is a pretty lazy way to be able to dismiss something without actually engaging in it. Uh, One thing people often say, well, that's not orthodox. Okay, well, you know, maybe it's not, but that doesn't mean that it's, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that it's, we just have to write it off. I mean, after all, what did orthodoxy give us? Orthodoxy gave us years of crusades, inquisitions, witch trials, defense of slavery, and defense of segregation. Uh, Orthodoxy didn't do a great job of eliminating those things from the world. So uh, is the fruit of orthodoxy something that uh, you know, means that we should take it seriously, like in the sense that if it's not been taught in the last a thousand years, we should just dismiss it. I don't think so. But anyways, that's not what my allegiance is to. My allegiance is to God. And I say that because when we get into discussions like this, people love to throw out labels. You're just one of those blanks. And it's just totally, uh, to me, unhelpful. The subject we're going to be talking about today, of course, is women's roles in the Christian community. And I first want to say from the outset, that I am, in so many ways, unqualified to be talking about this subject. The person that should be talking about this subject is a woman. (laughs) That is, uh, women who maybe hold a complementary position, women that may hold an egalitarian position, or women who hold just whatever they believe to be true about God's Word, should be the ones giving this talk. The failure of the church, in my belief, is not giving women the microphone when it comes to these discussions. So why am I still recording the podcast? Some people would only listen to this if it was given by a guy, and that's the unfortunate reality of the world in which we live. That being said, I would love for you to flock to the Exploring Faith, Pursuing Grace Facebook page, and for the, especially the ladies out there, to give us your insights to this subject. I'm just giving my opinion of it, and my opinion is limited severely and should automatically be called into question because I am not a girl. (laughs) I have not experienced the things that the ladies within the churches of Christ have. I do not know what it is like to be told that you can pass a tray sitting down, but you cannot pass a tray standing up. I do not know what it's like to be told that, sure, the people in 1 Corinthians 11 were able to uh, say prayers in the assembly, but people in the 21st century can't. So I don't know what that's like. So it'd be better coming from someone who does know what it's like. So I encourage you to engage each other in discussion. Don't just listen to this podcast and accept what I have to say. Talk with people who've experienced these things, who have not changed their mind, 
as well as who have changed their mind and see what they have to say because uh, that's where that's how we'll move forward as a movement not through listening to the guys the whole time but bringing girls into the discussion as well so i just want to say that from the outset all right uh, and also, the other reason I'm giving this podcast is because it's my podcast, and you asked me my opinion on it, and so <laughs> I'm giving you my answer. I'm going to start off by giving an, an answer that was not helpful to me when I first started even considering the subject. You, you have to understand that for years, I'm talking 23, 24 years, uh, th- the answer to this was a given. Women cannot participate in any public way in the assembly, whether it is teaching teaching a class, preaching a sermon, saying a prayer, leading a song, singing on a praise team, nothing, right? And when I asked the question before, when I was little, hey, well, why can't a woman teach, you know, a class? Because that's not technically the assembly. We make a big deal about that's not a worship service, so I can't, well, it might give the wrong impression, was the answer that I was given. And I don't think that's a very good answer uh, at all, by the way, but that's the answer I was given, and that might be the answer that you were given as well. So, so this answer that I'm about to give you of why I believe women should be allowed to fully participate in the Sunday morning assembly wasn't helpful to me to start with, but I hope in the course of this podcast, we can get to the point where it's helpful to you. And that is, well, it's obvious. Why wouldn't they be able to? That's such a, what a weird rule, right? Like what would be the point of that to prohibit women from, from participating in the Sunday morning assembly in a more public role? Like what? Really? Like that's what we're hung up on? And so, again, that might not be helpful to you, but maybe by the time we get done, it could be. So I want to walk you through the process of sort of how I changed my mind on this fast subject. And we're going to start by going to 1 Corinthians <coughs> chapter 14, okay? And we're not going to the passage that you may think that we're going to in 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, in fact, we're going to start a little bit later, uh, uh, sorry, a little bit earlier in the discussion in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Right, because this is a passage I mentioned a while ago, and this is a section about head coverings. And those of you who are, who come from a more non-institutional background, uh, you probably are very familiar with this passage. Whereas someone from my background is really only familiar with verse sixteen. If anyone is disposed to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. So, that's really the only passage I really read out of this chapter, besides the ones on the Lord's Supper. So, you're probably more familiar with this than I am. But listen to what he says here in First Corinthians eleven. He says that any man who prays or prophesies with something on his head shames his head, but any woman who prays or prophesies with her head unveiled shames her head. It is one and the same thing as having her head shaved. Okay, we're not going to get into discussions on chemotherapy and stuff like that right now. The point is, is that the woman apparently takes on the role of praying and prophesying. And this is, he's talking about here, traditions as a church, not private prayer life, but when they would come together. That's the context of the whole discussion from uh, 1 Corinthians 11 all the way through 1 Corinthians chapter 14. In fact, that's the whole discussion of the whole whole book, right? Because he's writing to a body of believers, not to individuals. But here we have these ladies who are praying and prophesying with their head covering, with their head covered, which shouldn't surprise us, by the way, Because in the Old Testament, in Joel chapter 2, there was a prophecy that in the last days, the sons and the daughters would prophesy, right? And so in Acts chapter 2, when the 120 are in the upper room, they all begin to speak in tongues as they're moved by the Holy Spirit. This was not something limited to just the dudes. They all had the Holy Spirit fall upon them. Uh, John the Baptist in Matthew 3 He wasn't talking to the apostles when he said, I baptize you with water, but there's one coming after me whose shoes I'm not worthy to do, (laughs) worthy to tie up, that he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He was talking to the common people, not just 12 apostles, right? So the baptism of the Holy Spirit was given to the whole church, not just the men, and the men and the women prophesied, all right? The men and and the women spoke in tongues. And this is what we see in 1 Corinthians 11, so nobody would be surprised by this. In fact, by the way, up until the passage we're about to read in 1 Corinthians 14, here in a few minutes, there is no hint, there is no indication whatsoever before this chapter, which was written about AD 56 or AD 57, that women would be any way prohibited from full inclusion in the work of the church, in ministry, 
in prophecy, in prayer, and speaking in tongues. There's no hint about, of that at all. When Mary and Martha were together, Jesus very specifically said that her role as a disciple would not be taken away. She had chosen the good part of sitting at the feet of a rabbi, and that would not be taken away from her. She would not be stuck in the kitchen, right? When you look at the first person who proclaimed the gospel, Mary Magdalene, uh, what do we see there in John? She's the first one to carry the message of the gospel to the, to the guys, to the apostles, right? She's the first person to see the risen Savior. There's no hint at all in Scripture from Old Testament to New Testament that women would need to keep silent in the church. You don't get that impression, even maybe, maybe even the possibility of that impression, until you come to A.D. 56, 26 years after the ministry of Jesus. Do we even get this idea, right? I just want to cement that <laughs> into our brains. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 12 is where we're going to start. And if you look at an older version of 1 Corinthians 12, like, for example, in the 1995 uh, New American Standard, he says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren. And a lot of people go, oh, brethren, that's adelphos, right? So adelphos means uh, it's, it's brothers. But it's a little bit more expansive than that, right? It's like in Spanish. If you have one guy and a group of girls, you're going to use the masculine pronoun to define that group. You're not going to use the feminine pronoun. You're not looking at the balance, the makeup. If, if there's one guy, that's going to make it masculine. And the same thing's happening in 1 Corinthians as well as in all of the, uh, in all of the New Testament, right? When Paul or someone is writing to the church, or whenever someone stands up and talks to the people, like in Acts chapter 2, when Peter stood up and he said, Brethren, he's not just talking to the guys in the audience. He's talking to everybody. Everybody was listening to the gospel that day. So like, for example, in Romans, he says, I do not want you to be aware, brethren. <laughs> uh, rather, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren. He's not saying there, okay, ladies, close your ears. This part's just for the dudes, right? He's addressing the whole congregation, the believers, the brethren. That's why in more... Uh, and even up, more updated versions, like the New American Standard uh, 2020 edition, um, like the New, Revi New Revised Standard Version updated edition. And I believe, don't hold me to this because I didn't think to check it until literally just a second, but I think the NIV translates it this way as well, if I remember correctly. Okay, but again, don't hold me to that one. He says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters... I do not want you to be ignorant. They translate Adelphas to the more inclusive brothers and sisters to emphasize that he's addressing the entire congregation here, not just the guys. All right? So that's 1 Corinthians 12, 1. He talks about a variety of gifts in verses 4 and following. Okay? And he says, it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone Okay, and everyone there is not, again, not just the dudes. Everybody had the Spirit. In fact, he says just a few passages below this, a passage you're probably familiar with, that we are all members but one body. For one, by one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Not just the guys, but all of them, right? He's not just addressing the guys here. He's addressing all of them. Okay? In 1 Corinthians 12, 27, he says, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets. Remember, Joel 2, Acts 2, your sons and your daughters, daughters will prophesy. Okay, well, if it's first apostles and it's second prophets, then what about these other things? Third, teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. If you have that second tier, if you think about it like an umbrella, and you have the apostles at the top, and then you have the prophets underneath that, and that we have evidence of women prophets, not only in the prophecy of Joel and two, uh, Joel 2 and Acts 2, but also in Philip's daughters, then you would see that the things below that would apply to them, could apply to them as well. Forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues, teachers, right? If they have that second tier, then why wouldn't they have the ones below it? Of course, there's questions about female apostles, but I'll leave that to your own research, uh, and I'll give you some resources for that here in a little bit. Okay. Let's keep going uh, to chapter 14. So he tells them again, Pursue love and strive for the spiritual gifts, and especially that you may prophesy. Is that just for the dudes? Well, no, it can't be, right? Because 
first off, no one would assume that because there's not been any indication that women can't participate fully uh, in the worship assembly up to this point, right? Paul hasn't written First Timothy and Titus uh, naming men as elders or deacons, right? He hasn't he hasn't written First Timothy two, telling women to keep silent in the church. He hasn't even gotten to First Corinthians fourteen where there's something that seems like that's what it's saying. Up to this point, nobody in the entire church would have any idea that he's leaving women out of this first verse. Desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. We've already seen evidence of women prophets in First Corinthians chapter eleven. Right? There's, there's no reason to exclude them to this point. He goes on and he says, uh, those who prophesy, notice verse 3, those who prophesy speak to cornstalks out in a cornfield so that men won't hear them. <laughs> no. He says those who prophesy speak to other people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. Let all things be done for the encouragement of the church. And women prophesying is part of that. There, there is no uh, women, women teaching as part of that. There's no hint of exclusion up to this point. Okay, those who speak in a tongue build up themselves. But notice, those who prophesy, just the guys or anyone who has the prophetic gift, just the guys or also Philip's daughters, just the guys or also Priscilla, just the guys or also Anna, who who saw Jesus when he was born and proclaimed the gospel powerfully to the people that were coming to the temple to worship, who expected the arrival of the kingdom. But, to the, but those who prophesy build up the church. Now, I would like all of you to speak in tongues. Just the guys are also the girls. But even more to prophesy. Why does he want them to prophesy? Because prophesying is for the building up of the church. Now, he says, I would like all of you to speak in tongues. <laughs> and all of you to prophesy. Just the guys or the girls included. How could they not be? He already told them that they were in 1 Corinthians 11. He's addressed them as a congregation, my brethren, my brothers and sisters. What would be the, the reason, the logical reason for excluding them from this passage? Up to this point, we have none. We only have this bit about the head covering, but that's the only strange thing we've seen so far, right? Look at verse, four, at verse 6. Now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I speak to you in some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? It is the same way with lifeless instruments that produce sound, such as the flute or the harp. If they do not give distinct notes, how will what is being played on the flute or harp be recognized? What's he saying? What's he saying here? If I come to you, you want me to speak prophetically. In some, notice what he defines under that: revelation, knowledge, prophecy, or teaching. He's saying that he wants them to desire that gift of teaching. Tongues are great, but prophecy is what can build up, right? And he's telling the entire congregation to desire that gift. Why does he say that in verse 12? So with yourselves, not just the dudes, since you are striving after spiritual gifts, who's striving after spiritual gifts? The guys or the guys and the girls? Does it matter what bathroom they go to? Does it matter what kind of drawers they wear? Seek to excel in them. Why? For the building up of the church. In cutting off the women from being allowed, what, what was the list there? To give a revelation, to give a knowledge, to give a prophecy, or to give a teaching. You are cutting off half of the membership of having the privilege and the honor to build up the church. You are silencing half of God's mouthpiece in doing so. Right now, let's take a look here at the following verses, and I want you to see if you notice a contradiction here. All right, pay close attention. He says, verse thirteen: Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray for the power to interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unproductive. What should I do then? I will pray with the spirit, but I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit, but I will. Sing praise with the mind also. Otherwise, if you say a blessing with the Spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say the amen to your thanksgiving since the outsider does not know what you are saying? For you may give thanks well enough, but the other person is not built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others also. Notice, in, other to, in order to instruct others also, 
That is, the prophetic gift was given for the purpose of instruction. So someone says, well, sure, women could prophesy in the assembly, but they can't now because we don't have prophetic gifts anymore. Well, the purpose of prophecy was for instruction. It wasn't just to make a prediction. It was to teach, to instruct. So if women could teach, regardless of whether or not it was by prophecy or by preparation (laughs) and study and searching the scriptures daily in the first century, then why couldn't they do that just as much today, right? He says, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. So what's he saying here? He's saying prophecy is better for the unbeliever, the, the outsider that comes into your assembly, right? Tongues will just confuse them, okay? Notice what he says in verse 22. Tongues then are a sign not for believers, while prophecy, oh wait, sorry, let me, re- let me start reading in verse 21. Oh, this is good. He says, in the law it is written, pay close attention, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people, yet even they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Tongues in are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers, while prophecy is not for unbelievers, but for believers. Well, wait a minute. How, do, how does that work? Th- doesn't that contradict what he just got done saying? What are tongues for? Are tongues for the believer or for the unbeliever? Didn't he just say that it's better to speak five words with your mind than 10,000 words in a tongue? So where's this coming from? He quotes the law, and then he gives this statement that's apparently contradictory. I don't understand. Well, no, Notice verse 23. If, therefore, the entire church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you're out of your mind? Oh, he's not giving an argument here. Of, of his own in verses 21 and 22. He is citing an argument that they were making out of the law for the supremacy of speaking in tongues. And so then he goes, wait a minute. If the entire church comes together and they all speak in tongues, people are going to think you're crazy. But then he says, but if all prophesy, which is what he was saying a while ago, speaking with his mind instead of with the tongue, if all prophesy, And an unbeliever or outsider who enters is reproved by all and called to account by all. After the secrets of the unbeliever's hearts are disclosed, that person will bow down before God and worship, declaring, God is really among you. Wait a minute. Does that mean that that person worshiped God without being baptized? Uh, Okay, sorry. Hang on. (laughs) Whoa, we just went off to the right. Uh, Just throwing that out there. But anyways, do you see what he's done here? He's, he, they're using an argument from the law in verse 21 and 22 to make this argument about the supremacy of the tongues. And Paul's saying, hold on a second. You can't just quote a passage, quote a custom to justify what you're doing, right? You're not thinking about this logically. You're, you're trying to one-up each other, and you've missed the whole point. Okay, <laughs> hold on to that thought. Let's get to verse 26. So what should be done then, my brothers and sisters? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. Wait, what do they have? And who has it? Just the dudes? No, keep it consistent. It's the brothers and sisters. They all have a hymn. Somebody has a lesson. Somebody has a revelation. Somebody has a tongue. Somebody has an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If anyone speaks in a tongue, just the guys? No, if anyone Let two or three prophets speak. We saw in chapter 11 that women could be prophets. Well, wait a minute. (laughs) Where's all this about women keeping silent in the church? Notice verse 28. You'll see it. If there is no one to interpret, let them be silent in the church. Why? Because it's not being done for edification. Okay. See? If someone, verse 30, if someone sitting receives a revelation, let the first person be silent. See, the, there, is, there needs to be order. This isn't just a, you know, like a, where they lower the cage and they bring in all the wrestlers and they have the summer brawl and whoever wins, you know, is the, you know, champion of the world or whatever. This is, <laughs> this needs to be ordered, right? You can all prophesy one by one, just the guys or all of them, so that you may all learn, that is, women were teaching, and all be encouraged. That means women were building up and encouraging. How about that? Now look at verse 34. Women should be silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate, as the law also says. If there is some, something they want to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. 
wait a minute. What? <laughs> wait, what? Are we reading the same thing here? What happened? What? What happened to women prophesying and praying in chapter 11? What happened to brothers and sisters? Each one of you, speak in turn, speak in order. Uh, you, can, you have a teaching, a revelation. Where in the world did this come from? In verse 34 to 35. Oh, wait, wait, wait. As the law also says. Wait, we've, we've seen this, haven't we? Back up here with the tongues, remember? They quote the law, and then they misapply it. Tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. And Paul's like, no, no, no. If, if you did that, you'd be crazy. So notice, I notice again, who's making this argument? Women should be silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate, as the law also says. Well, didn't Paul say that the, that the veil in 1 Corinthians 11 was a good enough sign of that, of that, of that order? Now, I know you're out there, some of you might be questioning what that order is and how to specifically interpret that. That's not what I'm worried about right now. We're dealing with people in a first century context. This is how they think. Was the veil not enough sign of that order? Why should they also be silent? Notice he says, if there's something they want to learn, let them ask their husbands at home. That's not what Paul said. Paul said, one person speaks, two people, you know, someone else interprets. Two people add their prophecy to it. Someone else brings in their revelation, brings in their hymn. They work together. They interpret it in community. This isn't a thing where the husbands have all the knowledge and they go home and instruct their wives. This is a community learning and growing together, all exercising their gifts. Verse 34 and verse 35, like we saw back in verse 21 and 22, stands out as being out of place, stands out as being odd, right? Notice what Paul says. And by the way, where does the law say that women should not speak? It doesn't make any sense when you go back and you read the Old Testament. You don't don't find that anywhere. He says, did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only ones who it has reached, anyone who claims to be a prophet or spiritual must acknowledge that what I'm writing to you is a command of the Lord. Anyone who does not recognize this is not to be recognized. So he reinforces it. My brothers and sisters strive to prophesy. In other words, you people who are telling these women that they should keep silent in the churches after I just explained to you how to keep it orderly, you need to shut your mouth because you are speaking out of line. God's word did not originate with you. I'm the apostle here. What I'm telling you is the commandment of God. And if you tell them these brothers and sisters that they can't prophesy because you speak in tongues and you think you're better than everybody else, it's time for you to sit down and stay silent. You're not going to be recognized as an authority because I told them that they need to strive to prophesy. But then he dials it back. He says, but do not forbid speaking in tongues. That is, yes, strive to prophesy. Yes, strive for mutual edification. I'm not shutting these other people out. I'm just telling them they need to chill out for a second and understand that they are not the ones who are running the show here, right? But then he says at the very end, but all things should be done decently and in order. Yes, the women can pray and prophesy in the assembly, but let it be done in order. Yes, people can speak in tongues, but let it be done in order. Yes, people can sing a hymn one after the other, but let it be done in order. This isn't Hogwarts where everybody's singing a different tune to the same song and the Weasley tends twins end up singing a funeral dirge for like 16 minutes and nobody can eat at the great feast. I mean, this is, this is supposed to be done in order for mutual edification. Whew, okay. Let's take a breather. Whew, gotta shake that one off a second. That, that was a lot. I was preaching there for a minute. Huh? Okay. I want to give you some books. Some of these books I've read, some of these books have been suggested to me. I'll give you the ones that I've read first. The first one is called uh, The Role of Women in the Christian Community by Dallas Burdett. All right? You, you can find that on his website, freedominchrist.net. I'll link that in the description. These other three books I've consulted. Uh, some of them I've read through. Others I've just consulted uh, for specific references. One is called Women in the Church, A Biblical Theology of Women in Ministry by Stanley J. Grins. Uh, Craig Keener wrote a a review of this, and Craig Keener, he has some good material out there as well. I haven't read his book, uh, so I can't vouch for it in particular, but uh, it's called Paul, Women, and Wives. By the way, there's also a book on CecilHook.net. I'll try to remember to link that one too, that has some good material on uh, women staying silent in the church. Uh, This one is also pretty good. It's called I Suffer Not a Woman. And it is uh, called a uh, subtitle, Rethinking 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 15 in Light of Ancient Evidence. And that's written by Kroger, uh, Richard Clark Kroger and Catherine Clark Kroger. 
And then finally, I have this other book, Why Not Women? A Fresh Look at Scripture on Women in Missions, Ministry, and Leadership by Lauren Cunningham and David Joel Hamilton alongside uh, Janice Rogers. And then this other book is one that I have not read all the way through. I have taken a look at it. Uh, Craig Keener has a good review of it. It's been suggested to me by other people. I just have so much going on, I can't read every single book in the universe. Uh, But this one's called Slaves, Women, and Homosexuals, Exploring the Hermeneutic of Cultural Analysis by William J. Webb. So it's good to read wide on this subject as well. Um, I would encourage you to pick up some books that are um, written from a more uh, complementarian perspective too. Uh, But those are the ones that I found to be helpful in rethinking this position myself. All right. I say all that because when we get into 1 Timothy 2, I'm not going to be able to give you as much information as you'd probably like, all right? But I do want to set the context of 1 Timothy for you. The first question we have to ask is, to whom was 1 Timothy written? Well, it was written to Timothy. And where was Timothy stationed as a missionary? He was stationed in Ephesus. We know this uh, from the very first chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 3. He urges Timothy to remain in Ephesus so that he may, pay close attention here, that he may instruct certain people not to teach different things. Now, that's from the New Revised Standard Updated Edition. If you're to look at the uh, New American Standard 1995, what you're going to read is to teach certain men not to teach strange doctrines. And if you were to consult the New American Standard Bible, the 20... 20 edition or whatever it is, he says, uh, you would instruct certain people not to teach strange doctrines. That's because we have a similar situation here that we do in, uh, uh, wherever that was, 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, The word here is uh, tis, right? And so uh, the newer translations translate this, any person, somebody, right? This is not specifically the male uh, gender, right? So I encourage you not to teach, or to teach certain people not to teach different things, not to teach strange doctrines. He says in verse 4, and not to occupy themselves with myths and endless genealogies that promote speculations rather than the divine training that is known by faith. Okay? The aim of stru- such instruction, he says, is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. This is all from 1 Timothy 1. Now we're in verse 6. Some people have deviated from these and turned to meaningless talk, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they make assertions. Now I'm going to read you another quick passage here. This is from 1 Timothy chapter 5. Okay, He's talking about what widows would be allowed to be on the list uh, for church assistance, basically, and he encourages the younger woman to remarry, and one of the reasons why, he says, uh, they, besides that, they uh, learned to be idle, uh, gadding about from house to house, and they were not merely idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not say. Now, when we read gossips and busybodies, we think about people who are going around spreading rumors about folks and getting all up in everybody's business, right? But it's interesting that the word translated busybody here in 1 Timothy chapter 5. Um, remember, keep in mind, we're thinking about Ephesus in the back of our minds. Okay. It's going to come from a word that I'm going to absolutely uh, butcher, but it looks like it's uh, periegros, 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 busybody. But when you do a search on this, right, from uh, in the Greek, uh, across all the passages in the New Testament, what you come across is Acts chapter 19 where Paul is stationed in Ephesus. And what happens at Ephesus? Many of those who, this is in verse 19 of Acts 19, many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone. And they counted up the price of them as to be about 50,000 pieces of silver. The word magic here is the same word translated busybodies in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 13. My friend Dallas Burdett points out that he believes what's going on here is that Timothy, writing to instruct certain people, not certain men, but certain people, not to teach strange doctrines. The strange doctrines they were teaching, at least part of the strange doctrines that were being taught, were the old wives' tales, uh, as he says in another passage in, in uh, First and Second Timothy, uh, related to their gods and goddesses. The magic books that they brought 
and burned in Acts 19.19. 19. That's where the word busybody comes from. Like I said, if you want more information on that, I encourage you to go to my friend Alice's uh, website, freedominchrist.net, and download his book on women's roles in the Christian community for absolutely free. All right, go check that out. Uh, he'll get into all this way deeper than I can. I'm just giving you a taste. That's why I gave this list of books, because I don't want to um, disappoint the people who asked for a detailed exegesis of 1 Timothy 2. A lot of that requires a Greek and cultural analysis, and from my limited experience, I can only go so far in that. And it would be disingenuous for me to try to make extensive arguments from the Greek uh, and the culture not having been profess- professionally trained and accredited in that specific realm. Okay? So that's why I'm uh, passing you off to Dallas. I want to also say, though, that I find 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy 2 and the arguments that I've just presented to you and the arguments I'm going to continue to present to you for the next few minutes to be helpful. But they are not as helpful, (laughs) to me at least, as what I will share with you towards the end of the episode. And this may run a little bit longer than some of the others. I can't see the time now, but I imagine we're getting up there. So... Let's go to 1 Timothy 2 and take a look. All right. Let's begin in verse 8. He says, Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Do the men at the Memphis School of Preaching lift their hands when they pray? Do the men at the Fried Hardman Lectureships in the Question and Answer Session lift their hands when they pray in every place? Just, just a question. Okay, verse 9, likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing and modestly and discreetly. Oh, let's stop right there. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking shorts above the knee, backwards Christian camp style, lets everybody line up on the side of the volleyball court so all the counselors can check to make sure your shorts touch your knees, or otherwise you have to go back to your uh, cabin and change in shame. And everybody pulls their pants down a little bit so their underwear showing so that the uh, pants cover their knees and they don't get sent back to change. <laughs> and then as soon as they go to the breakfast, uh, you know, the girls roll up the waistband anyway. So what the good did that do? No, that's not what he's talking about here. <laughs> Sorry if I triggered some of you with <laughs> old modesty talks. He says, uh, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments. By the way, was Isaiah sinning whenever he went out and preached uh, you know, naked as a jaybird. I mean, I don't know, whatever. Uh, by modestly, though, he says, not with braided hair. How many of you ladies have braided your hair? How many preacher's wives have braided their hair? How many did the whole Leia Skywalker thing, you know, growing up? Not with braided hair, not with gold. How many people have gold earrings, uh, the hoops, you know, or uh, or gold rings or pearls? I've seen tons of ladies at church wearing fake pearls or costly Garments. Come on. Costly garments. Compared to third world countries, pretty much every garment we wear is costly, huh? But rather by means of good works, as is proper for woman for women making claims to godliness. Now I'm reading from the New American Standard there. Um, but I just want to point that out to you. We look at a lot of that as cultural, right? There's a passage I want to point out though as well. I think it's first Peter what was it, chapter three? He says Do not adorn yourselves, verse 3, outwardly by braiding your hair, by wearing gold ornaments or fine clothing. Rather, let your adornment be the inner self. Um, New American Standard there, he says this. This is important, so stick with me here. Your adornment must not merely be external. So sometimes, in other words, whenever we see this, uh, this sentence that says, do not do this, but rather do this, it's not necessarily to the exclusion of the first statement, right? Paul Paul may not here be saying that braided hair and wearing gold and wearing pearls and wearing expensive clothes is inherently a bad thing, right? Instead, what he could be saying is, instead of focusing all your attention on this, so much more adorn yourselves with good works, right? Or as Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, do not merely adorn yourselves with these external things, but it instead be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. That construction, do not do this, but rather do this, again, is not 
doesn't have to be to the exclusion of the first sentence or the first statement there, but rather it's for the purposes of emphasizing the second statement as being a much more des- desired thing, right? Sometimes we think about it like this. If an unjust judge you know, can treat that woman in Luke 18 with grace, then how much more? Should we expect God to treat us with grace? So the same thing could be said about 1 Timothy 2. If we were to de-emphasize dressing our outward appearance, how much more are we to emphasize adorning our hearts with good works, right? So then he says in verse 11, Let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. Okay? This is the passage that's in question, of course. Now, some people point out this as a woman, or I mean a a, uh, a wife and not a woman uh, because of the Greek there. But again, like I told you, I'm not the expert on the Greek. I defer to the authorities, which I've quoted to you already. Let's think back through here, okay? Let's think back. Do we demand that men lift hands, pray in every place? No. Do we demand that ladies at church take off their pearls, take off their gold, don't wear expensive clothes? No, we don't. Should we? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, with our materialistic consumer culture, perhaps, but we don't, all right? Well, why do we then, do we stress this other one? Let a woman learn in full in silence with full submission. Okay, well, the reason why we say, well, notice what he says in verse 13. This is an argument from creation. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Oh, that's true. But do you know what? That's the same exact argument that Paul uses for head coverings in 1 Corinthians 11. Is that, is that not true? I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of the woman, and God is the head of Christ. What does he say in verse 8? Indeed, man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for the sake of woman, but woman for the sake of man. If we're going to bind the argument from nature in 1 Corinthians 2 and say that women can't keep silent because of that, then we also have to say that women must, must wear a veil over their head. And yet we recognize veils on the head, raising hands in every place, and the dress, uh, you know, modesty rules in First Timothy 2 as being cultural. And yet when we come to this last one, we say, no, this is a, a divine law for everywhere and for all time. Now, you think about Timothy's context in Peter, uh, sorry, Timothy's con- I was thinking of the next passage, Timothy's context in Ephesus, with the goddess Diana or Artemis there, with the priestesses, with their, uh, with their um, familiarity with women in leadership roles within the within the temples there, you have him saying that certain people were teaching strange doctrines and they weren't to be doing that. You have in First Timothy five these certain people were going about teaching these wives uh, wives tales, old wives tales related to their to their black magic, like from Acts chapter 19, verse 19, you would understand why he would tell the women to keep silent in this particular context. I really wish that I had the book over here on my desk, but it's like just over there, 10 feet away. It's by Rachel Held Evans, and it's called Inspired. And she says at the end of one of her chapters there, and I would love to be able to go get that and read it, she says that there may be cases in churches where the women are told to keep silent. There may be... times in churches where the men are told to keep silent because they're not behaving in a proper manner. They're trying to take over. They're trying to, uh, they're trying to teach things that are contrary to the gospel of Jesus. They're trying to disrupt the assembly. In that case, they should be told to keep silent. That doesn't mean that just because I say in that specific case that women are to keep silent in the church does not mean that everywhere for all time women must keep silent in every church. Paul's writing specifically to Ephesus, who has these problems. Remember this. Now, this book was written even later than 1 Corinthians. Now we're talking like mid-60s here. There's no hint then, before you get to the mid-60s, that women should keep silent in the church, if we understand 1 Corinthians 14 and the way that I talked about it a little bit while ago. This is the first mention of it. This would be the first time when Paul says women must keep silent in the church and he waits till the mid 60s to mid 60s to do that after 35 years of women prophesying and praying in the assembly with their head covered after 35 years of Aquila and Priscilla after 35 years of Mary Magdalene after 35 years of Phoebe and Lydia and all these other women leaders in the church really 
it's it's a specific situation that he's dealing with. It's not a universal thing in all places and all time. It is so easy to write off passages as cultural when they are inconvenient to us. A holy kiss, Romans 16. Pray, uh, pray with your hands lifted in all place. But when it comes to a passage that conveniently supports the type of world in which we live, where women were restricted from voting, where women were restricted in certain public offices, where women were restricted in certain workplaces and expected to stay home barefoot in the kitchen, then it becomes mighty easy to dismiss the cultural argument and make this passage into an everlasting thing binding for all time. The same thing happened with slavery. The same thing happened with segregation. And the same thing is going on today and prohibiting women in the assembly to participate just as a man can. And it comes from our culture and its baggage that we should discard and bonding it in all churches for all time goes against 99% of the Bible. This one passage in 1 Timothy 2 that seems to be a prohibition was a specific cultural prohibition that had to do with Timothy's specific situation in Ephesus at that time. Okay? At least that's what I think. Keep in mind that in Genesis 1, going back before Genesis 2, but go into Genesis chapter 1, how, what did God do on the, on the sixth day? Right? He made man and woman in his image. Verse 27, God created humans in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Male and female, he created them. If we restrict the ability to talk about God to just the men, then we are cutting off half of God's creation from talking about who God is. And therefore, we are cutting off, in a sense, half of his image. Think about the different personality between men and women, different strengths, different weaknesses, different temperaments. Do you know that... um, Women are less likely to convict an individual to the death penalty than than men are. I read an article about that some time ago. Think about the different perspective you would have on grace. Think about how you could talk about fatherhood and motherhood from those two perspectives. The role of husbands and the role of wives. And notice what has happened when you've just given men the floor in those discussions. In the times that you do give women the, the floor, it's off in the corner with only women and only giving material that's been sometimes written and approved and proofread by the men. It disenfranchises half of God's priesthood. And that's where we come to 1 Peter chapter 2. I want to read you this passage as my friend Dallas did one time, and it was very helpful to me. 1 Timothy 2, 9. I mean, 1 Peter 2, 9. You are a chosen people, except the women. A royal priesthood, except the women. A holy nation, except the women. God's own people, except the women. In order to proclaim the excellence of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. (laughs) Aren't we all chosen people? Aren't we all a holy nation? Aren't we all God's own people? If that's the case, then we're also all a royal priesthood. And the function of the priesthood is to worship. Is to offer up worship. And in Romans chapter 12, the worship that we are to offer is our day-to-day lives. Whenever we can find worship of the Creator to a one-hour assembly on Sunday morning, we end up giving ourselves an opportunity to bind laws, to bind universal laws that God is not bound, to create restrictions where God has not restricted, to come up with patterns where no pattern has been given, because we have attempted to recreate the liturgy of the Old Testament uh, in the New Testament context and exchange sacrifices, for singing and all this other stuff, and we end up making all these rules that that divide, that tear asunder congregations all over the world, and that disenfranchise half of God's people from being able to teach and expound upon the wonderful truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is beyond time that we stop. Now, let's get back to my very first point here, and I'm going to make an additional point after this. It is Why do I believe that women should be able to participate in the Sunday morning assembly? Because it's obvious. Why would, what would be the reason behind not allowing that? What is the moral logic, right? 
what 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 law is being offended right what's how could that be anything but good to have everyone participate in the building up of the church in the mutual edification of the church what reason would there be for prohibiting such a thing oh i know what the reason would be i think you know what the reason would be too the only time that we should prohibit that is if their participation and that could be the guy's participation too is in violation of the fruit of the Spirit. Listen to this in Galatians chapter 5. And I want you to pay attention to one of these fruits. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Can those qualities be exhibited by women participating in the Sunday morning assembly? What about this? Patience. Can a woman wait her turn to pray and exhibit patience? (laughs) Kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, how could you say that a grandmother or a, or, a, or a single mom or even a lady who's not, who does not have her own children, how could she not demonstrate the qualities of generosity and faithfulness and gentleness in participating in the Sunday morning assembly? But here's the last one, self-control. See, I think that's where the prohibition comes in First Timothy chapter 2 was a lack of self-control. And I think that's where a prohibition would come under certain shepherds uh, in our day and time, a lack of self-control. Anyone who demonstrates a lack of self-control should be prohibited from uh, participating publicly in the assembly until they get themselves under control. <laughs> that's, whole, that's Paul's whole argument in 1 Corinthians 14. We judge these things by what the fruit of the Spirit is telling us. If it's not pr- pr- producing the fruit of the Spirit, that's whenever we seek uh, for the prohibition. That would be the moral logic behind denying someone the right to participate in the Sunday morning assembly is if they are not producing the fruit of the Spirit through their participation. In 1 Corinthians 14, remember he says at the very end of that passage, So my brothers and sisters, strive to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. And that, my friends, is my thoughts on women's roles in the Christian community. This is a big discussion. There's a lot to this. There's some of you out there who disagree with me, I'm sure. There's some people who wholeheartedly agree with me. And there's some people who may be asking why I didn't quote Galatians chapter 3. I didn't quote Galatians chapter 3 because I personally don't find that passage all that helpful in this discussion. But, uh, you know, there are people who do. And I can't fault them for that. I can't help what I find helpful and what I don't find helpful. That's my own problem, I guess. But anyways, that's it. Hope you enjoy. Hope you'll uh, check out my website, danielard.net, for articles, ministry updates, uh, book quotations, things like that. And if you haven't checked out my new book, uh, How a 25-Year-Old Learned He Wasn't the Only One Going to Heaven, it is available for $7 on an ebook on my website or on my Gumroad account, which you can find in the description below. Hope you all have a great day. Thank you for joining me on this podcast, and God bless.